So if you take your Bible, please find Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, and Paul is now continuing and beginning once again his third missionary journey, evangelistic journey, and is going to come to the city of Ephesus. You remember the seven churches in the book of Revelation. The first one was the church at Ephesus. And if you went there today, you'd find that church missing. And uh, so Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. And uh, so when a church falls, and when a church falls, it's not God's problem, it's man's problem. So how important it is for us to be a praying people, how important it is for us to be a faithful people, and how important for us to continue to get the gospel out. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. And of course, the book of the Act, the book of Acts is the transitional book that takes us from the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, into the epistles. And so it's the only history book in the New Testament. So here in chapter 19, I want you to look at verse 23 momentarily. And once again, uh, Paul is being attacked. And what's being attacked, of course, is the gospel. Now, before Christians were called Christians, they were called the way. And verse 23, and the same time there arose no small stir about the way. So that is an easy way of saying Paul was in trouble once again. Every city that Paul went to, he went to see people saved. And once they were saved and baptized, they again, of course, organized a New Testament Baptist church. So let's get chapter 19 ahead of us. And there are three sections here that you look, can look at, and uh, you can look at the word certain, certain. Verse one, again, we'll continue as we go through this chapter. I'm gonna read all 41 verses, just get it before you. Hope that you'll study and uh, give you an, an outline. And then, of course, we'll continue on. Normally, it takes about three weeks for us to finish a chapter if we remain in that chapter and the Lord doesn't move us another way. So as we begin tonight, Acts chapter 19, I like the way the chapter begins. And it came to pass. What a tremendous phrase, it came to pass. That while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. I want you to underscore, if you mark your Bible, the word certain, because we'll come across that word several times. Certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Man, you could preach that for a long time. A lot of God's people have no idea who the Holy Ghost is and what the Holy Ghost can do for them. And then there are those who don't like the word Holy Ghost. They like the word Holy Spirit. Well, a ghost is a spirit. This is the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, second question, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. Again, remember John looked to the coming of Christ. We look back at history. They looked future because he was coming. John chapter one and verse 29, John would say, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1.35, as Jesus walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Now, I like that. I like that verse. As Jesus walked, how did he walk? Well, he walked as a man of God. And we looked this morning and saw the importance of putting shoe leather to the Sermon on the Mount and our walk with the Lord. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, 
the Holy Ghost came upon them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Don't let that get you down, the word tongues there, because this is the last time in the New Testament that we, in the book of Acts, that we find the word tongues other than, of course, the book of 1 Corinthians. And all the men were about 12. And he went into a synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when diverse were hardened and believed not, not everybody gets saved. Not everybody receives Jesus Christ as their savior. Paul said, I became all things to all men that I might win some, not all get saved. And of course that breaks our hearts realizing this. <clears throat> but when diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the, that way, before the multitudes, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of Onterraneus. And he can, this continued by the space of two years. Paul spent three years in Ephesus. Said so all they that dwelt, which dwelt in Asia, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jew and Jews and Greeks. Isn't that amazing? All the people. Think about that. Establish a church. Do you reach your Jerusalem? Do you go to the regions beyond? Here, Paul is a busy man. And by the way, he's not the only man. Paul had a team, had a grouping of evangelists, preachers, going out witnessing for the Lord. It wasn't just Paul. There's no such thing as a one-man minister. There shouldn't be. And so we thank the Lord for all the faithful laborers here at Emmanuel. And God wrought spiritual miracles by the hands of Paul. Now how sad it is so many charlatans today try to make money by claiming to be faith healers. And uh, they use certain gimmicks uh, to dupe innocent people and naive people. And, uh, but Paul had the goods. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseased departed from them, and the evil spirit went out of them. Here it is the second time. Then certain of the vagabond. What's a vagabond? A vagabond is a wanderer, someone who's not in the same place for a while. Sometimes Christians play vagabonds especially if you have a city with a lot of Baptist churches in it, they get mad at the preacher in one church, they go to another church. They get mad at the preacher of that church, they go to another church. And uh, so we don't have that issue here. Uh, we're the only independent, fundamental, King James, blood washed, Bible-believing, separated, sin-hating, savior-honoring, Satan-fighting church. Amen? <laughs> then certain of the vagabond Jews exorcist. No such thing as exorcist. They are exorcists, but they're not. To think that someone can, by the way, apostles could do things that we cannot do, but they're gone. So there are those that teach that you can exorcise demons out of people. No, you just need to get them saved. People just need to get saved. And uh, so this exorcist business, of course, is a money-making business. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits. The name of the Lord Jesus saying, <laughs> this is almost kind of comical, what takes place. We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. You're going to talk about Jesus, you better know Jesus. We're not talking about the Jesus that our pastor preached. You better talk about the Jesus that you know. And look what happened to these guys. So we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, a chief priest, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, I like this. 
Jesus I know. Paul I know. But who are you? <laughs> I know about Jesus. We know about him. We know about Paul. Are you known in hell? <laughs> Do the demons tremble when you come on the scene because you're a soul winner and a separated saint for the Lord and a soldier for the Lord? We know about Jesus. We know about Paul, but we don't know who you guys are. And watch what happens. And the men in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. So that they fled. Well, I wish that would happen. <laughs> I'm not trying to be unkind, but all the charlatans, all the lying, false preachers that talk about having healing services, all that stuff would be nice if some demon jumped on one of those guys. And I'm thinking now of a precious family that we had years ago in our church. We met them out so winning. They were from a Pentecost church here in town. There was a discrepancy in the church and they had left the church and they were looking for a church and they said, can we come to your church? We have some differences of opinion on doctrine, but we won't try to divide your people. And they kept their word. And they were precious people. But the father, who worked for a certain school in town, began to lose his eyesight. And being the precious and gracious school that they were, they fired him rather than caring for him. So one of his sons, of course, he was an ex-Pentecost preacher from the East, decided to take him to Calgary. They were having healing lines in Calgary. The son meant well. The father meant well. And they drove all the way to Calgary and Calgary and waited in line to get healed. Of course, he didn't get healed. So there's a bunch of charlatans. As I said this morning in our message, and you read through Matthew, through Luke, you find that everyone that Jesus healed got healed. There was no healing lines. He didn't go around saying we're going to have a healing service. As people came his way, he healed them. The apostles had that power too. I'd like to have that power, wouldn't you? I'd like to have that power to be able to help six people, but I, I can pray for them. I can sure enough pray for them and pray the will of God. Some people act like I have a silver bullet sometimes, and that, that um, embarrasses me. And they say, could you pray for thus and so? Uh, preacher, pray for this. And I will pray, but I will pray the will of the Lord. Someone who's backslidden away from the Lord and has lost their job and not given to the Lord and living in sin, and someone calls them and say, can you pray my husband gets a job? I'm not going to be unkind, but I'm going to pray God's will to be done. You understand that? So I'm not a silver bullet, and I'm not a yes man, and I say that being kind. But there are so many charlatans in the world, and they prey on innocent people. They prey on sincere, innocent people, and God have mercy on them, because they're going to face the Lord someday. By the way, in the southern states, just going further, because we'll talk about tongues in a moment. But a lot of the southern areas, they had tent meetings. And a lot of the Pentecost evangelists were playing with snakes. And they were confused about Mark 16. Mark 16 talks about the signs that would follow the apostles. But not just preachers, the apostles. They had raised the dead and speak with tongues, which were languages and so forth. And if any deadly thing touched them, they'd be, they of course would be healed. Well, these Pentecost preachers got to playing with poisonous snakes and so many of them died that they kind of quit that. And uh, they should have quit it. They shouldn't have never begun it. But let me get off this or I'm never gonna get out of here. And uh, so naked and wounded, verse 17. And this was known through all of the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, I guess so. And the names, just think if they had Facebook. I don't have Facebook. 
But just think if they had had Facebook or some of these other medias, they would have said, uh, can't believe what happened at the church. Can't believe what happened to the seven sons of Sceva. Uh, there was this man full of demons and they were going to exercise him and the demon jumped on them and they ran away naked. Uh, that'd be all over the news. And uh, so these people are, of course, fearful in verse 17. And the name of the Lord was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. I like that. Verse 18. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. She's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So, and many that believed came and had a testimony service, showed their deeds. Now watch this. Many of them also, which use curious arts, brought their Harry Potter books, bought their Ouija boards, brought their Dungeon and Dragons, bought all their demotic stuff, and they burnt them. Notice, this is in Ephesus. Brought their books together and burnt them before all men. Have you ever done that? We got saved. We had some things in our home that we burnt up. We got rid of. Uh, we got some albums. You don't know what an album was, but it's about this big or this big, and it's made out of plastic, and you put it on a table and it plays music. That's called a record. We burnt them. We had some other unmentionables in the home, not anything wicked, but just some things that a Christian ought not. We burnt them. Um, my wife and I, at that time, I wasn't living for the Lord. She wasn't saved. But when we got saved, we had some golden, uh, our church had a burning service. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been in the church that had a burning, so burning some things. We had, uh, we had some horoscope things of gold. I wish I had those today. <laughs> and we both had necklaces. I had mine and she had hers. Now I don't wear a necklace, but I'm a Christian. I was a Christian then, but I wasn't living for the Lord, never grew and so forth. But we took those things to this burning thing and we threw them in the fire. <laughs> and then I got smart, you know, sometimes too soon old, too late smart. And I realized I should go get those things out of that fire and sell them and get some money from them. But somebody beat me to it. So here they're having a fire and uh, they're having a fire, not a fire sale, but they're getting rid of their contentions and uh, their wicked stuff and burnt them before all men. And they counted the price of them. Now think about this. Now, if you lived in Bible time, how much did you make a day? A dinero. A penny. Imagine that. Can you just imagine that? We're going to put into your account every day a penny. We're going to e-transfer e it right into your account a penny every day. Well, they sold their books and found 50,000 pieces of silver. Well, a penny a day, the money they made getting rid of that garbage was, was in comparison to 530 days work. I'm sorry, 530 years work at a penny a day. I'm glad the wages have gone up a little bit, but a penny a day. And I'm reminded of those people that went to work for the Lord and those that came in the morning, they agreed for a penny a day. Then they, through the day, others began to come and began to work and finally the last crew came probably about 4.30 and they got a, or said you can get a penny a day. At five o'clock the whistle blew, it was time to get off work and they came and lined up. <clears throat> the people that came at six o'clock in the morning and started, they got a penny. The people who came at 4.30, they got a penny. And the people that got a penny from 6 in the morning till 5 o'clock in the evening got a penny. And they said, a penny? 
They just begun and they're getting only, they're getting a penny too. Not fair. Well, there's a great lesson in that. That when you begin to serve the Lord and get right with the Lord and obey the Lord and become a servant of the Lord, uh, regardless of when you start, uh, if you start late in life. Now, thank the Lord for people that get saved at an early age. Thank the Lord for Sunday school children that get saved early. They have their whole life to serve the Lord. But maybe you get saved later in life in your life in 30s, 40s, or 50s, and you serve the Lord, uh, you're also going to get a reward. And that's an encouragement to our hearts for those who are saved later in life. Verse 20. So mighty grew, mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Boy, that's a blessing, isn't it? They believed the Bible was real. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia and to, Jerusalem, and to go to Jerusalem saying, after I had been there, I must take a cruise and see Rome. That's when I would, it was not sightseeing. He was out seeing people saved, but he wanted to get to Rome. And by the way, he got to Rome. He didn't get to Rome the way he wanted to get to Rome, but he gets to Rome and we'll see that and he'll be in chains. So he went into Macedonia. So he sent into Macedonia two of them. Again, not a one man team. That ministered unto him. Timotheus and Erastus, the two us's. Did you see that? But he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And the same time there arose no small stir among that way. Can you imagine? Seven naked men running down the street. Demon chasing them. A big bonfire. People throwing things in the bonfire. People testifying, people getting saved, people surrendering. Man, it was a tremendous sight. And the devil got mad. This morning before the service began, we had a bunch of confusion up here on the platform. Most of it was me because I didn't have my, my cords in the right place and so forth. And Mrs. Glenn was going, I thought, my girdle showing or what's going on? <laughs> but it ended up pretty good. So here's this attack. Here's this trouble. Satan is mad. And now notice, if you will, and a certain man. So if you're counting, that's the third time. And a certain man named Demetrius. He's another us. A silversmith. Don't tell Terry that which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small stir, small gain under the craftsmen. These guys are making money. So you have the charlatans trying to exercise people, demons out of people, and now you have those that are making money off of religion. Happens all the time, all over the world. And he called together, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation. So here's Demetrius. <clears throat> Something's happened bad in town. <clears throat> Something bad's happened in town. I heard the town drunk got followed that way business and he got baptized. I heard there were 12 uh, people that thought they were saved, weren't saved, they just had gotten wet and, and I heard they got saved too. I've heard of all kinds of things happening here. We better keep an eye out. Before you know it, we're going to be losing our income. That's the Glennon version. Verse 25. Whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have made, we have our what? Wealth. <clears throat> Can you imagine the day? I like to have an imagination. I have a pretty big one. 
<clears throat> but can you imagine the day that Peter, James, and John and the disciples were in the temple with the Lord and the Lord was sitting there and <clears throat> had some leather and he was putting together something that looked like a whip. And some of the disciples were scratching their head, what's he making a whip for? And in just a little while, the Lord finished that whip. And I can see him saying, get out of my house. Who is he saying that to? The money changers. When they came to the temple, they changed their money to temple money. And of course, the people in the temple were ripping them off. Then the animals that were brought for sacrifice, uh, some of them were, had three legs instead of four legs, didn't look very good. And Jesus overthrew the tables and said, my house is a house of prayer, not of merchandise. Now let me say this about that. I think if there's a person in the church who is reputable, has a business, whatever that business might be, that people from the church should support that individual. Amen? Everybody that has a business just said, <laughs> So I'm not trying to make money, but I'm just saying, if, if you're going to buy something, you have a need, and something the church has a business, I think you ought to support them. Amen? I'm not advertising. I'm just saying. When, when I get old... You say it was too late. Which one of you said it's too late? <laughs> and something comes in my mind, as I said this morning, God, i got to stop and I want to develop it. So Jesus made a whip and threw out the money changers twice. He did that twice. Wealthy crooks. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout Asia, they knew Paul. It wasn't Paul the pizza man. It wasn't Paul the Greek. It was Paul the Jew. Paul the disciple. And they knew about him. They knew who he was. Somebody was listening when that demon-filled man said, I know Jesus. I know Paul, but who are you? Somebody heard that and ran and told these crooks. This Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people. Hallelujah. He's a soul winner. Much people. Saying that there be no gods, little g, which are made with hands. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. And her magnificence should be destroyed. Danger, despised, destroyed Diana. Whom all Asia, see back in verse 26, Paul is winning these Asians to the Lord. And the world worshipeth. When they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great! is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was full of confusion. You know, God's not the author of confusion. These churches that say they're having a Holy Ghost revival and people are being slain in the spirit so-called and falling on the floor, God's not in that. God is nowhere near that. People will stand up and raise their head back and Say, God gave me a message, and they go, Miga, Maga, Muga, Muga, or whatever they may say. And they say that God gave them a message. I heard a woman one time stood up, and by the way, 1 Corinthians 14 says women ought to keep silent in the church. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean women can't teach, because they can. But when it comes to authority and standing behind the pulpit, women are to be silent. This woman stood up and started saying a bunch of stuff, and her husband stood up and said, 
God told my wife that all the women in the church should sell their rings and put it on the altar. And the wise pastor said, wasn't a Pentecostal church, the wise pastor said, well, I think the Lord told her to have all the men sell their trucks and bring me their, car, their truck keys. <laughs> Goodness. And the whole city was full of, with confusion and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain, see that? And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him, that he would not advertise himself unto the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was confused. And the most part knew not whether they were come together. Why are we here? What's going on? What's with the confusion? Well, these silversmiths and the Diana clique and cult are, are chanting, great is Diana of the Ephesians for two hours. That'd, be, that'd give me a headache. Verse 33. And they came and they, they drew Alexander out of the, of the multitudes, the Jew, putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town's clerk heard, had heard, had appeared, appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, <clears throat> what man is there that knoweth not how the city of Ephesus is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana, of the image with, which fell down from Jupiter? Really? <clears throat> I wonder how Demetrius worked that out. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe he got on a high building or something and made one of those those silver shrines and threw it and it landed and he said, wow, look at there. Come right from heaven. Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. Why? Because the government is coming. If you have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, not like you guys, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess, Whereof if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open. And there are deputies. Let them impel one another. So there are magistrates. Go find them. Go figure it out. This is a lawful thing. Go talk to the judge. But if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it should be determined in a lawful assembly. If we are in danger, what are we in danger of? We're in danger of Rome. To be called in question for this day's uproar. There being no cause whereof we may, whereby we may give an account of this concourse. When he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Father, we do pray that as we get into this 19th chapter, pray that you'll encourage us instruct us and Lord that we see what happened in the first century how the church was pure how the church was powerful how the evangelistic work moved without airplanes multimedia the internet and other ways of getting out the message. It was footwork. It was ship work. It was donkey work. 
And Lord, we thank you for this precious book of the Acts of the apostles full of the Holy Ghost. Bless the preaching of your word to our hearts and souls in Jesus' name, amen. I just want to take the beginning here. Twelve guys show up. Paul gets a look at them. And there's something peculiar about them. You know, our spirit ought to bear our spirit with others that were saved or not. You, you can tell. No mark on the forehead. But there's something about traveling the world and meeting up with other Christians. Uh, you don't have to necessarily wear a big cross or wear some kind of a medal or medallion to show that you're a Christian. But if you're right with God, people will know about it. And God's people know God's people. We have a kindred spirit. That spirit is the Holy Spirit. And these 12, we see in verse number 7, there were 12 men. They were disciples. So Paul, waiting, of course, here at Ephesus, Apollos is still at Corinth. Paul is passing through the upper coast and he finds some disciples. And he asked them a couple good questions. Number one, have you received the Holy Ghost? Do you know anything about the Holy Ghost? Look at John chapter 16 for a moment, please. John chapter 16. Or John chapter 3 first. When a person gets saved, you get baptized by the Holy Ghost. You are placed into the body of Christ by the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said in John chapter 3, and verse number 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at verse 8, or verse number 5. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I believe the water there is the word of God. And the Spirit of God, it takes the Word of God and the Spirit of God to make a child of God. Look at John chapter 16 now. So we're thankful that the Holy Spirit indwells the twice-born child of God. And chapter 14, we'll just kind of go along here. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, Jesus said. I will pray the Father... And he shall give you another comforter. That word comforter is paraclete in Greek. It means one of the same. Just like me, I'm leaving, but if I leave, the Holy Ghost is coming. Just like me, he's the comforter. He's the one that's going to come and put his arm around you spiritually. And he's going to comfort your soul. That he may abide with you forever. Again, this is why a child of God cannot lose their salvation. We're sealed under the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God. Look at verse, the next verse, 17. Who is he? The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. I'll just keep that and go to Romans chapter 8. Verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8 and verse 8. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, that, no, if so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Continue in you. Remain in you. Stay in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, that's what these 12 men were. Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you've been saved? When you got saved, did you receive the Holy Ghost? 
They answered and said, we don't know if there be any Holy Ghost. And as I said this morning, it's sad to think of how many of God's children have no idea who the Holy Ghost is. He's God, the Holy Spirit. He's the third person of the twin Trinity. He's the silent one. Jesus glorifies the Father. The Spirit glorifies the Son. And we glorify the Trinity with our lives. And we need to talk to the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is a command. Ephesians 5, 17. And be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine words in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Daily filled with the Spirit. You can't say I got filled in 66 or 86 or 2006 because you need a daily feeling. Why? Because you sin. You sin. I sin. We sin. And when we sin, we need to confess our sin. The problem with our dear Pentecostal friends is they believe when you sin, you lose your salvation. They believe because you know that you're saved and you have the Holy Ghost in you, that that gives you a license to sin. No, that's not true. We're more responsible. Grace is more responsible than law. So we sin. Why? Because God doesn't save our bodies. We still have wants and desires and aspirations and appetites. That's why Paul said, I die daily. Die to the flesh daily. And then fill to the spirit. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, there it is again, dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body. You die in Christ. Revelation says, blessed are the, the, they that die in the Lord. You die in Christ. And the Spirit of God is going to raise you up. Paul said to the Ephesians, and you have he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sin. Made alive, born again, made new. Walking in newness of life. He that raised the Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. But I love the flesh. I love the flesh. To live after the flesh. Look back to chapter 13. Verse 10, our memory verse, love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now is the high time to wake out of sleep. So many of God's people sleeping, slumbering, soaking up the word of God, but not doing anything about it. A lot of Christians are like a sponge. They soak up, but they, you have to squeeze them to get it out. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed, to be sure. I'm closer to heaven today than I was in 1962. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, drunkenness, not in chambering and wantingness, not in strife and envying, but look at verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill it and the lust thereof. Now going back to John, please. Verse 26. 
But when the Comforter is come, he will send unto you, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth. Remember chapter 14, I will pray the Father. So Jesus is saying, I will pray the Father. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If not so, I'd have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. Don't go, Jesus. Don't leave us, Jesus. Don't leave us alone. We don't want to be alone. You're not going to be alone. I, I couldn't be close to all of you. I had my inner circle. I have my inner circle. Peter, James, and John. You know one of the biggest things that disciples fought about for three and a half years is who's going to sit at his right hand, who's going to sit at his left hand. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, mother came to Jesus and said, I have a request. What is it, mother? Well, I don't want to be presumptuous, my Lord, but could you let my boys sit at your right hand and your left hand when your kingdom come? The other disciples found out about that and said, we ought to knock your blocks off. But while the Lord was on the earth in his body, everybody couldn't get close to him. In the Old Testament, you could not even come anywhere near God. You couldn't come to the mountain, you'd be killed. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus was there for three and a half years, but he had his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. But now we New Testament saints, we have the Father in heaven, the Son sitting at the right hand, and the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Jesus in heaven, the Spirit of God down here, and that's wonderful. So the intimacy that we can have with the Father through the Holy Spirit is marvelous, but we miss it. We miss it. We're not filled as we should be, Ephesians 5.18. We are sealed, Ephesians 1.13. These are down payment for heaven, I mentioned this morning. Verse 26, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Look at chapter 16. Verses 7 through 11, he's our soul winning partner. Verses 7 through 11, he witnesses on the inside as you speak on the outside. He brings conviction, speaks about judgment. You don't have to worry about putting someone in the corner or collaring them. You just give out the word, and the Spirit of God will do the rest of it. He'll take his word and speak to a person's heart and show them that's right. Your mother does love you. She's telling you the truth. Your husband does love you. He's telling you the truth. Your parents do love you. They're telling you how to get saved, darling. Daddy, I don't want to go to heaven alone. And the Spirit will bear witness to help you to witness to your daddy. So we're thankful we have a so winning partner. Verse 12, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them not. Why? Because you're in the flesh. Peter always getting in trouble, impetuous Peter, always getting in trouble till after Pentecost. After Pentecost, he wrote two books, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. 1 Peter is suffering, 2 Peter, false doctrine to false preachers. Verse 13, how be when he, the spirit of truth, has come. <clears throat> you hear me from time to time praying before I preach. And I say, Lord, give us illumination. That is, the Holy Spirit opened the book to us. He will open it up to us. So Psalms 119, verse 18. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things that are thy law. 
Psalms 119, verse 130. The answers of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. And we pray for illumination. We pray that the Holy Spirit will turn on the light and speak to our hearts from his word, and he will. He's saying, why don't you ask me? Preachers spend a lot of time looking at commentaries. I look at commentaries. But he wants to say, and he does sometimes, put the commentary down. I said this morning, all the years I have preached on the Sermon on the Mount, and it hasn't been many times I've preached on it. But I've recognized this week, not from a commentary, but from God, the Holy Spirit, just what's behind the Sermon on the Mount. How to live the Christian life. How to live as an everyday Christian by the Spirit of God that's in you and then the principles and the precepts that Jesus taught from the side of that mountain. And we can do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And what a blessing that is to my soul and to us. For he shall not speak of himself. Again, churches that magnify the Holy Ghost. That's not Bible. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive a mine and shall show it unto you. 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Take it up in verse 18. I love verse 10, don't you? Our three tenses of salvation. Who delivered us? Who delivered us from so great a death? That's sanctification. I'm sorry, justification, being saved. Doth deliver, that's sanctification, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver. That's glorification when we get to glory. Now look at verse 18. But as God is true and our word towards you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, that of course is Silas, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him, boy, if you ever get a hold of that, in him. If we ever get a hold of that in the book of Ephesians, chapter one, in him. Someone says, I'm not worthy to be saved. Of course you're not worthy to be saved. <laughs> Who is worthy to be saved? Everything that we have is in him. We're accepted in the beloved. We're adopted in the beloved. And it's all in him. Hallelujah. In Christ. In Adam all die. In Christ all are made alive. In him. It's all about him. I've been adopted in him. I have an inheritance in him. I'm sealed by the spirit of God in him. He's the earnest of our down payment. He is my down payment for heaven. And if I could be lost, the Holy Spirit would be lost. He seals me under the day of redemption. I have this ring. It's, um, it's an old ring. It's gold. Oh, I shouldn't say that. Someone cut my finger off. <laughs> but it has a seal on it. I was thinking the other day I was preaching and I was saying that preachers should go to, should have their pastors teach them. Preachers. And then if you look in my office, there's a, some degrees from a Bible college. Double standard? No, my pastor was the chancellor of the Bible college. Just wanted to get that out. <clears throat> 
So I have a Google Ring. Looks impressive. Cost $100 back in 1936. Last time I was in, and there's a stone there, and I have a cross under it, so I can witness by saying what's in the cross, what's in, what's in the stone. They look close, close, you can see the cross. Who's on the cross? Nobody, because Jesus is no longer on the cross. But the blue thing gets chipped from time to time, and I took it in to a jeweler a while back. He said, it's probably worth about 3,000 bucks. I said, Sal! <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> What did I, how did I get off on this tangent? Oh yes, sealed, adopted, an inheritance. Peter said it's incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven for you. By the way, are you leaving an inheritance to your kids? An inheritance. <clears throat> Verse what? Verse 20. For all the promises of God in him, that's where I stopped, are yea and in him, amen. You say yea, you claim that promise according to the will of God and the word of God, and God says, let it be so, amen. God's checkbook. Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Watch it now. Who hath also sealed us. Did you see that? Sealed us. The seal on my ring. Given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Hallelujah to God. Now look at Ephesians chapter 1. Just talking about this Holy Ghost. Do you know him? Romans 8, 14, he'll lead you. Ephesians 1, 13 with 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he will seal you. Look at this. <clears throat> Verse 13, here's how salvation comes about. No different salvation from John the Baptist than the Apostle Paul talking to those 12 wet guys wet guys I mean they were wet guys <clears throat> they weren't washed in the blood guys they were just wet they got baptized baptism doesn't get you to heaven it's the shed blood that gets you to heaven and trusting Jesus and whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth faith comes by hearing hearing by the word with the gospel of your salvation the shed blood death burial and resurrection and whom also after that ye believed, you were what? Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. He's our down payment for heaven. You buy a car, you buy a home, a big ticket item, you, you buy it, you give a down payment, you're going to finish it, you're going to pay it off. Which is the earnest of our inheritance under the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of of his glory. He's our soul winning partner. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. Shall we stand together? <clears throat> These guys were wet, but they weren't washed. They needed to get saved. And they got saved. And Paul laid hands on them and they spoke with tongues. That was languages. That a Jew, by the way, the tongues were for unbelieving Jews. Four times in the Bible. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. Did they speak in tongues? But after Acts 19, no more speaking in tongues. Why? Because 70 A.D., Titus the Roman obliviated, obliterated the Jews, and they were scattered. So what is the criteria of speaking in tongues? Number one, an apostle. Number two, a Jew. Every time someone spoke in tongues in the Bible, there was an apostle present, and there was a Jew. 
So these poor duped people today, by the way, every church in our town speaks in tongues. The Catholic, both Catholic churches, they, they sing in tongues. But it's not scriptural. I wish I had the gift of tongues. I wish I could talk to my <clears throat> Tagalog-speaking friends and different dialect friends, and, and I'd be speaking like I am in English, and they could, they could hear me in their language. I wish I could meet up with a person that could speak Swahili, Afrikaan, French, German, Italian, Polish, Russian, Arabic, whatever, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, American knees. And they could hear me in their language. That's the kind of tongues I'd like to have, amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for perfect salvation. Lord, we'll see as we go through the Sermon on the Mount that you're going to deal with folks by their fruit. By their fruit, you should know them. Who? Real preachers. Real preachers. By their fruits, you should know them. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that you've sent at the request of your son, you've sent us the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> he sealed us and he placed us into your family. And now we have identification with one another that we belong to the family, the family of faith. And our spirit bears witness with your children around the world that we've been born again. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And Lord, you're not the author of confusion. And there is so much confusion today. These folks at Ephesus were confounded because of the confusion. And Lord, we're thankful that you do everything decently in order. Order our lives this week. Guide us, direct us. Never know what a week will bring. Two of our families, one in a hotel, two in a hotel and one in a hospital. Some are driving to Edmonton this week and we take it for granted now that it's a twin highway, but things can happen. So Lord, this week, help us to wait on you, help us to listen to you, help us to be living for you, help us to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of our flesh. Help us to be spirit-filled Christians, pleasing to you, obeying your commands in the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to be better Christians, spirit-filled Christians. Bring us home safely tonight. And Lord, those listening that are wet but not washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus. They've been baptized, baby adult, but they've never been born again. Thank you that you paid our sin debt in full with redemption, shed your blood, Poured it out on that rugged cross. Tasted death, rose again, ascended to heaven, interceding for us and coming again. We pray even so, come Lord Jesus. Save that soul that's near as hell. Reclaim the backslidden Christian. Strengthen your saints. Thank you, O oh God, for our core people. The Bible says that the disciples were pillars of the church. Some were pillars of the church. The right foundation. Thank you for the pillars of Emmanuel. Help us to keep on keeping on. Give us rest tonight. Strength tomorrow. And Lord, what this week holds, we're going to trust you to hold us together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. Thank you for coming.